So I'm going to go ahead and get started um, and introduce Judy O'Donnell. Um, she is our CFO. Um, and Judy worked in public accounting for many years. Uh, she was dealing primarily with entrepreneurs who owned and managed their business in a variety of industries. She eventually moved out of a out of public accounting into industry as a controller and then a CFO. 17 years ago, she began working for a local private developer who owned low-income housing, apartments, and managed condominium associations, and also senior living properties. Um, 10 years ago, the senior living part of that business was sold to a New York investment company, and Judy at that, at that time um, joined the New York company to create a new REIT, a real estate investment uh, trust based on senior living, which eventually brought her uh, seven years ago to Terwilliger Plaza as our CFO. And so I want to welcome Judy and thank her. This, I think, is the third year in a row that you've done this webinar for us. We always get great feedback, and I'm sure today will not be any different. So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome Judy O'Donnell. And again, if it if you feel like you're missing a little something uh, or we don't get to one of your questions, we will definitely um, follow up. So welcome, Judy. Thanks, Teresa. Hey, uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Instead of going out in the sunshine, I promise the sunshine is going to be here for a few days. Um, so hopefully you'll get another opportunity if you're joining us. I'm going to share my screen. As I have this lovely presentation all prepared for us, and hopefully it will keep me on task. We're going to talk about buying into CCRCs. Of course, I work at Terwilliger Plaza, so you know I have a bias, um, and I'm not going to apologize for that. But I do know something about other parts of our industry, and um, and I'll be doing some compare and contrast and talk about other things relative to CCRCs. So the first thing I want to talk about is profit versus nonprofit at Terwilliger Plaza. So, um, and I'm going to talk about CCRC contract types. There are three contract types. It's not a typo. I'm going to talk about them in an order of A, C, and B. We're going to talk about buy-in fees versus monthly fees, what they pay for, why, why we have both. Uh, talk briefly about can you afford a CCRC, um, our qualification process, the tax benefits associated with a CCRC, um, what happens if you live longer than your assets. We're gonna talk about refundable versus non-refundable contracts. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some non-financial considerations of CCRCs. Um, not my strength, but I'm sure the marketing team can give you lots of those. So first things first, profit or not for profit, where does the money go? And the first thing we have to talk about is there are a lot of businesses right now in the senior living space. They are for profit. They exist to make money for the owners, whether that be a New York investment company or an individual owner. Um, they are in the business to make money. REITs and, and the for-profits wouldn't be there if there wasn't an opportunity to make money. Because they're in it for profit, they have risks of ownership of a real estate venture. Real estate uh, goes up and down in value. You have all of the costs of keeping that property up to date, so people want to continue to live there. Um, they have to decide uh, the standard that that original building was built to. Um, they talk about the ownership of providing services to a vulnerable population and the risks associated with that. There are a lot of legal, political, and economic risks all um, taking place. We saw some of that during the pandemic when some of the senior living communities struggled uh, to stay open and to give protection to the people that live there. Um, and we have to return some kind of profit to the owners or they won't continue to be in business. 
Now, what I saw working for a local developer who built and ran his own senior living uh, portfolio, then sold to this big investment company. We grew that portfolio all across the country, buying lots of other businesses and trying to operate those. My personal belief is that the fur further the owners are removed from the operations, the higher we need regulations and the poorer the decisions at the facility tend to be. Um, it's really hard if you're not living in the community, if you're not have eyes on to see what the needs of that community are and to be able to respond to them timely. My opinion of uh, the for-profit side of senior living. We're a not-for-profit and there's some misunderstandings of what not-for-profit or non-profits mean. So I, I got to get our terminology straight here. Nonprofits are formed explicitly to benefit the public good. Not for profits exist to fulfill an owner's organizational objective. Nonprofits can have a separate legal entity. We are a corporation. Not for profits cannot have a separate legal entity. Um, so Terwilliger Plaza is a nonprofit. We have three separate legal taxing entities that um, make up what Terwilliger Plaza is as a single site, standalone uh, nonprofit community. Terwilliger Plaza was approved as a nonprofit 501c3 organization. The purpose, the public purpose, is to provide housing and care to seniors. Do we make a profit most years? Yeah, we do. We need to, or we wouldn't continue to be in business. And do we pay income taxes? No, we do not. So hopefully we have some of our terminology straight before we start here. The public good is to provide housing for seniors. If or when Terwilliger ceases to be in operations, any profits that have accumulated the value of the land and the businesses goes to the Common School Fund of the State of Oregon. If that entity doesn't exist, then the board of directors has to distribute the corporation's remaining assets to one or more 501c3 organizations. We're required under Oregon CCRC rules to have cash reserves of three months of operating expenses and one year of debt payments on hand at all times. Typically, Terwilliger exceeds those requirements by three or four times. So financially, we're pretty stable um, and well within Oregon's requirements for a CCRC. In addition to Terwilliger Plaza, we have two supporting organizations. They are the Terwilliger Plaza Foundation and the Lesta Howell Memorial Trust. Lesta Howell was, um, it is recognized as the visionary who got the first group together to form to Williger Plaza. And it was formed to be a place for retired teachers to live in community. At the time, 1960 roughly, it was the largest HUD loan um, ever given. It cost $5 million to build the existing Terwilliger Plaza Tower. I laugh because we just finished Parkview at a much higher number. Terwilliger Plaza is certified by an organization called CARF. This is not a requirement of CCRCs. Um, it is required by our board of directors who believes that that is a, an important part um, to show the public, to show people how we intend to run our organization. CARF stands for the Commission on Accreditation of Rehabilitation Facilities. It's much broader than just senior living properties. They do a lot of other accreditation. Um, you can look it up. It's pretty amazing organization. It sets extremely high standards for how we need to run our organization and our facility. And we meet those requirements every year. Um, so every year um, you go through a big recertification process every five years, and we just completed that last year. And then every year there are certain reporting and checking up on us that is required for us to continue to be listed and certified by CARF. 
CARF uses an interesting word. Um, we talk about profit, we talk about net income. Those are all um, important things that you end up with some more money at the end of the period of time than you did at the beginning of the period of time. So the CARF quote is margin ratios, that's what they use for profit, indicate the excess or deficiency of revenues over expenses. One of the drivers of success for senior living providers is the organization's ability to generate annual operating surpluses to provide future resident care expenses, capital and program needs, and to handle unexpected internal and external events. We all probably remember the pandemic being one of those external events that we uh, financially had to be prepared for um, some senior living properties uh, did not survive going through the pandemic or the few years after that. Can you tell if the CCRC is financially healthy? Kind of an important thing. Um, CCRCs do go and get taken over by larger organizations. They find themselves in financial difficulties and have to be taken over uh, by another operating entity. This is an older article, but I, it still is relevant. And the website, mylifesite.net is a good uh, site. They have really good information about CCRCs. And they talk about what is the occupancy ratio in independent living. Um, they think it's important that you maintain a 90% or more uh, occupancy. And we, have been able to have that uh, 90, 95 to 96%. Most CCRCs get their financing through public bonds. And the institution that rates those bonds is called Fitch. And we get a rating by Fitch. Not all CCRCs go through this process. It, it costs money to be rated by Fitch. Um, we go through that and we are rated as a BB plus. Um, we were a triple B before we started building Parkview. And during the construction of Parkview, it is typical that they downgrade um, because we have a major construction project. So it'll be interesting to see how they rate us this year now that Parkview is complete. But since we don't have a full year of operating um, history yet on Parkview, they may leave us at that BB uh, double B plus rating. We'll see what they do. There are financial covenants required with our bond financing. And one of the things to say whether a CCRC is financially healthy is whether or not those covenants are being met. Ours are. If they are not met consistently, then the, um, the bondholders, the organization that controls the bonds, can bring somebody else in to run your organization and to figure out a way to get it back into a healthy financial position. Um, is there positive cash flow from operations? Yes, most years. I say most. Historically, this has not been a problem for us, but during the construction of Parkview, there were there are some challenges, especially in how generally accepted accounting principles require us to account for the marketing costs of a new building. Um, and that those are considered part of your current year operating expenses, and uh, they they eat into our uh, revenue, our our positive cash flow, and our revenues. Um, is there a future service obligation? That means do we have an obligation to take care of somebody into the future? And yes, we we have a future service obligation. Has a detailed actuarial analysis been performed? We do that every single year. It's um, about time for us to go through that process again. And do your current assets exceed your current debts? Very important. Yes, ours do. Is the provider financially regulated by the state? There are still states out there that do not have strong regulations over CCRCs. Some don't even have very good regulations over um, senior living. So those are things that if you're looking at uh, at a CCRC, if you're looking at a retirement community, these are some things that you might want to keep in mind to make sure that the organization you're looking at is financially healthy. More information at that mylifesite.net if you're interested. So we're going to talk about contract types. Most CCRCs 
unlike the for-profit world where you're just paying rent like you would in an apartment, um, we have a contract that we require. And there are three types of contracts. There is an A contract. This is an all-inclusive contract. That's a really good way to think about an A contract. Part of your entry fee is paying for the future cost of your health care. When you move from independent living to assisted living, um, it requires little or no extra monthly cost. Um, you are essentially on an A contract buying a life insurance, a, a, an insurance policy that pays for your future care needs. The process of going and becoming a member in a CCRC with an A contract will require a health check. Uh, they will have health questions that they ask you because they're insuring you. So that's a uh, contract type A. We are not a contract type A. We do not ask health questions for you to become a member in our community. The other extreme from an A to a C is a C contract. And this is a pay as you go for services contract. This is typically what you find in the for-profit world. Their entry fee tends to be low. It's not really prepaying for future services. Um, it offers access to higher services, but you'll be paying market cost for those services. Um, as your future care requirements uh, grow and, and you need more help, um, you're going to be paying more for those services. So again, this is very comparable to a, a rental type community. There are a lot of people, poor profit businesses in that market. Nice thing about a rental community from an owner's point of view is if you run out of money, they tell you you need to move out. Um, that's the reality of a rental contract. So between the extremes of an A and a C is a B contract. It is a cross between the two. There are lower prepayment with discounts for future care and some care is provided in that contract type B. It combines the lower prepayments of a C contract and lower cost of future care because the reality is some people never need a lot of care, even at end of life. And Terwilliger Plaza offers this type of contract, a B contract. Even within those three types of contracts, there are a lot of variables. So my message to you is read the contract, ask questions, make sure you, and if you have family, make sure they understand what the facility, the contract, what the guarantees are in that contract, what your responsibilities are with that contract. So in our contract, um, we have a healthcare clinic um, within our building. You have access to that healthcare clinic. It does not have a doctor in it. It has a registered nurse. And we do some healthcare um, services in there, but we also charge for those services. We're not associated with any insurance company. So you would have to seek services in our clinic and then submit those to your insurance for reimbursement. Our contract guarantees you three days uncharged, I hate to use the word free, uncharged if you need to be in our care setting. So let's say you um, have a really bad case of the flu and you aren't able to take care of yourself at home. You, you can go through a medical intake process and spend three days in our care setting at no additional cost. And you can do that every year. Um, you do not accumulate the years, so you either use it or you lose it. Um, but this is really great if you have surgery and aren't comfortable taking care of yourself after surgery, you just want some extra help around you. We have those three days that we do not char charge for. Then within the CCRC, we also have a residential care area and an assisted um, care area. Those are both licensed in the state of Oregon. And we discount those prices to you because you're a member. If we have space in those uh, care settings and our own membership are not needing those, those uh, beds, those rooms, those care, we do 
admit outside people into the licensed care setting. We always try to remain uh, enough beds available so our members have a place if they need it. But we also need to keep our census high enough to pay for those licensed care areas. So people who are not members of our community pay 15% higher for all their um, care in those areas if they are not already a member of our continuum. This isn't uh, like an insurance product. Um, but it is kind of similar to that. <clears throat> Every community, though, has differences in their contracts. So again, you need to read the contract and compare them for what you understand, for what you think your needs are going to be. Um, and along with the contract, Every, mem every community probably has a member handbook, and that explains a lot of things about what life is like in our community, what the expectations are for you to be in our community, and what the, uh, the community is here to provide for you. So those two documents are really important that you familiar your, familiarize yourself with them. So when you join a CCRC, um, there is usually um, a, a buy-in fee. We call it a, a main, uh, I lost my train of thought. It's going to happen. A buy-in fee and a monthly fee. And I'm gonna talk about those two. Membership fee, that's what we call the buy-in fee. Um, this is a one-time fee and it's paid before you move into the community. Um, most are partially refundable over some period of time. Um, it could be six months, it could be three years, it could be two years, but usually we want to make sure, as most communities do, that you're going to be comfortable here. We don't want you to move in and be miserable and um, be, be locked in. So there will usually be a refund during some period of time at the beginning, even of a non-refundable contract. So here at Terwilliger, 15% um, of a non-refundable contract is non-refundable the day that you take possession of your apartment. The 85% remaining membership fee is refundable, all of it during the first six months, and then it declines over the next 40 months, uh, 36 months, so six months plus six. And some communities offer partially refundable contracts. We have one of those. Um, for some of our units, we offer a refundable contract. But again, these can take all, there's just all different types and flavors of refundable uh, or buy-in um, fees and how different communities handle them. So when you pay that membership fee, somebody might wanna know, what are those funds used for? It's a really good question especially since the for-profits and, and the rental communities don't require that kind of a fee. You're prepaying for some of those future healthcare costs. So every month um, or part of your membership fee is going to help offset our healthcare costs. If you're buying into Parkview, our brand newest building, in order to pay the bonds that built that building, the initial membership fees from people are going directly to pay for the construction of the building. Um, we had about $65 million worth of short-term bonds to pay for the construction of Parkview. Once those are all paid back, the membership fees come to Terwilliger, to us, rather than to the trustee to pay back those bondholders. And we're over halfway paid back on those initial um, construction costs for the short-term loans. So, but right now it gets a little confusing because sometimes I'm telling somebody that your check, your, your wire transfer to move into Parkview is going to US Bank Trust Department. And they're like, why isn't it going to Terwilliger? Well, that's why they hold um, the, the money for the bondholders and take care of making sure we are in compliance with those agreements and that the bondholders get paid back timely. If you're buying into the Heights or the Tower, part of the membership fee goes to a remodel and a refresh of your apartment. Um, Almost every new every apartment somebody moves into has been freshly painted, has new flooring. Um, we 
routinely replace kitchen and bathroom cabinets. We had a standard that was changed about uh, seven years ago where they weren't nice hardwood and, and nice solid surface uh, countertops. We upgraded everything to a, a really nice standard now. So anything you move into will have those. We look at the lighting, we change the window covering. So some of the money that you're paying goes to help offset the costs of those um, turning the unit and getting it ready for you. Usually in that process, you can also choose to upgrade if you want um, higher quality um, paint or something special. Um, maybe you want a really fancy carpet. You We can negotiate, but you will end up paying the upgrade cost for those things. In the older part of the building, building, the tower as we call it, it was originally built as a whole lot of little tiny studio apartments for those retired teachers. And what we found, what people before me found was that people wanted bigger apartments. They wanted uh, their spouse to move in with them. That little studio wasn't gonna cut it for them. So over time, we've moved walls in, in the tower. We don't do that in the Heights. We don't really do that in Parkview. Um, but sometimes we can do that in the tower and make an apartment just the way somebody wants it. But we will talk, talk to you and work with you on the cost of changing walls. Because you can imagine that's going to run up the, the cost of moving into that apartment. So those are the buy-in fees. We call them membership fees. Um, most CCRCs will have uh, uh, one of those types of fees. Then you're also paying a monthly fee, and we call that a maintenance fee. This is due monthly. We bill on the first of every month for services or for the rent during the month that you're um, going into. So the March, March bill is for March rent. It covers all of the operating costs of the community. If the monthly fees are not covering the monthly operating costs of a community, then that community is going to be financially in trouble. There's, there's just, you can't be um, digging into your reserves to pay your ongoing monthly costs, or you will soon run out of money. In a finan financially viable community, monthly fees cover the operating costs and have something left over for the rainy day. So the funds are used for wages, salaries, benefits, taxes, recruiting, education, all of those things that have to do with the staff who are here to take care of you, to take care of the building. That's 50% of our operating budget. So 50% of your monthly maintenance fees are going directly to pay for those kinds of costs. Then there are consumable costs. There's supplies, there's food, there's routine maintenance on the elevators, on um, our, the vehicles that we use. All of those things have to be paid for every month as well. We have utilities, we have telephone, we have the internet. All of those things have to be paid for out of those monthly fees. Then we have property taxes. Even though we are a not-for-profit, we are not exempt from property taxes. We get a discount on property taxes in the parts of our building that are exclusively used for care. But all of the independent apartments pay property taxes at the same rate as you do if you live in Multnomah County, like I do. We also have to pay for insurance. And over time, we've built all these buildings. We have interest associated with the bonds that paid for that those construction costs. And we we have to cover the cost of depreciation. Um, it's always a little confusing for people who don't spend a lot of time in the finance world to understand what depreciation is, but I will talk about it briefly. But that's the difference between monthly fees and those initial move-in fees. So there are two areas of confusion when it comes to financial accounting for a CCRC. One is the same thing every business has, understanding how depreciation is, is um, affects your operations. And the other one is how revenue is recognized in a CCRC. Give me a moment, I need, I need some water here. Thanks. Um, so I'm gonna talk really briefly about these. 
Depreciation is pretty straightforward. It's the cost of an asset divided by the estimated useful life of the asset. This is allocated to each period of time, so each month, um, because you're not putting additional cash in for that asset that you purchased. So <clears throat> if I buy a piece of equipment and I purchase it for $300,000 and it's supposed to last for 10 years, each month, I'm going to allocate $2,500 of depreciation to my operating costs. I need to make sure I make that much money each month or I will not be able to replace that piece of equipment when it needs to be replaced in 10 years. So imagine all of our buildings, every apartment, every remodel, everything, having to do that same thing with and, um, and have depreciation. So of our total monthly expenses before we offer uh, open park view, we had about 19% of our um, operating costs were depreciation. With Park View, brand new building takes up a whole city block. Um, our depreciation cost goes way up um, for the total campus. So our depreciation cost is going to be closer to 25% of our operating costs now that Park View is opened. Um, so things change. The monthly maintenance fees are fairly simple. Um, they're recognized in the month that a service is billed. So this is revenue recognition. This is one of those things that generally accepted accounting principles tell us how we can recognize revenue as a CCRC. So if you buy a meal um, or you have a meal, we're going to recognize that in the month that you had that meal. So we bill those at the end of the month. If you use services um, in any of our areas, you have a salon services, you um, have some coaching in the in the work and have workouts and, and somebody or massages, all of those are recognized in the month you had those services. That's pretty straightforward. So how do we recognize revenue on those move-in fees? So it's partially refundable over 40 months for a non-refundable contract. So maybe that's how you recognize that revenue. Unfortunately, that's not how we do it. GAP says that those moving fees have to be recognized over the life expectancy of the member or the members if it's a couple. So we look at life expectancy tables, we look at our history and we say you paid $100,000 for your uh, membership fee and we think you're going to live 10 years. So we're going to recognize $10,000 of revenue this year. Well, that sounds pretty simple. Except every year that somebody lives, they're expected to live longer. So every year, that life expectancy number has to change. So the revenue being recognized for our financial statements based on those move-in fee never gets to zero until somebody moves out of the building. So it's uh, it's interesting. Those are the complications of our financial reporting. I'm sorry if anybody got lost in all of that. Um, so to fully understand the CCRC accounting, you do have to understand how that move-in fee is recognized in our financial statements and the funds that benefit the community now and into the future. Something you're probably wondering, and many people register for this, is they're wondering, can you afford a CCRC? It's a great question. So two things you have to take into account. One is your financial net worth. Pretty simple. All of your assets, subtract any liabilities, so that's your net worth. It's usually a value at a point in time. So you get your um, statements from Schwab or from your bank. That's your asset. Does it fluctuate? Yeah, I know it does. But do this as a point in time um, and subtract any debt that you have. And that's your net worth. There are some things you don't want to forget when you're talking about your net worth. Um, you have bank accounts, you have investment accounts, you have retirement accounts. You always want to get those at their current value. 
You may own a home or other real estate. That value changes. So you want to get as close to a real value for those real estate assets as you can. If you have some life insurance, it might have a cash value. You may have autos, RVs, who knows. You may have a very valuable stamp collection. Um, those are your assets. Do you have credit card debt? Do you have a mortgage on any of those real estates? You've got to subtract those out. And then one of the things that we talk about is the value of your long-term care insurance. This isn't as easy put in that asset category because they change, but we have software that will determine the value of that long-term care policy. Some things we need to know about it though, what's the maximum payout? Some of them have a maximum dollar payout. Some of them have a, num a maximum period periods that they pay out over. And people bought these long-term policies a long time ago. Some of those insurance companies have um, had financial difficulties. They have restructured. They've forced you to make changes about your long-term care policy. So it's really important that you understand what your long-term care policy is. Most of them have an elimination period, a wait period. So you can't just start day um, getting money from the long-term care policy uh, immediately. There's usually 30 to 90 days, some even 120 day wait period before that long-term care policy starts paying anything out. Then there's going to be amount usually per day that they're willing to pay. And that per day amount might change depending on whether the services being provided are in a skilled nursing facility, an assisted living facility, whether you're re receiving services in home. So sometimes we can use the value of your long-term care policy to qualify you to move into a CCRC. Or, um, sorry. When it comes, if this becomes important, if we look at your total assets and, and we're worried that we're gonna talk about what those qualifications are, we will tell you if we think it's important that you keep that long-term care policy active. What we ask for is if you start running into financial difficulties, again, you, you outlive your resources, that we be informed if you decide you want to cancel the long-term care policy because the premiums are too high. There is some opportunity for us to uh, continue to make those payments for you. It might be in our best interest to help you pay for that long-term care policy based on your other financial situations. So if we, we, we always look at the long-term care policy, but if we need you to keep it maintained, that will be part of the approval process. You will be told that you need to keep that policy enforced. Okay, so that's your net worth. And that's one of the things we will be looking at when we talk about a financial qualification. The other thing is your monthly or annual budget. We need to make sure that any income you have minus any expenses you have ends up with enough net income that you can continue to pay the monthly fees. When you're doing um, a qualification, most companies will give you a form to fill out. Um, we can take it any way you want. But what do we need? We need to know if you're still collecting wages, salaries, commissions, um, what your social security is if you have it, any pensions or retirement benefits. Do any of those have a cost of living built into them? If so, what does that look like? What is your required or actual 401k distributions? or other retirement distributions that you're taking? What kind of interest and dividends do you have? Whether they're taxed or not taxed, they're still available for you. Annuities, um, whatever annuity incomes you have, and any income from real estate rentals. What expenses do you have? Now, this is fun because if you still have your home, you have a whole bunch of costs. You may not have to pay for them every month, but you got to factor in some costs for determining when you have to pay for the roof, when you have to pay for major appliances, 
when you have to replace the HVAC or the water, or in my case, I live in East Moreland, we have trees, very old trees, and they break sewer lines. How often do you have to pay for that? And what's it gonna cost? You probably have property taxes. You probably have home insurance. Utility bills, water, sewer, electric, gas, internet, TV, um, all of those are expenses you're paying every month. What are your transportation costs? Some people have cars, some don't, but there's usually some kind of a cost associated with transportation. What clubs do you belong to? What are the membership fees? Are you planning to stay in those clubs and pay those membership fees? Do you have season tickets? Those are all expenses that you're going to want to continue to pay for. Um, and we need to make sure that your income covers those and your maintenance, your maintenance fees here. Do you have alarm or security services at your home? And do you have that long-term care insurance premium um, that you have to pay for? So when you're looking at your financial situation, you're looking at your income, these are the expenses you need to take into consideration to decide whether you can afford to be in a CCRC. Most people are surprised when they add that all up. Compare the cost that you're paying now to the monthly cost of being in a CCRC. Um, add in those costs beyond the monthly fee that you want to continue to have. So you're going to move into a CCRC, but I still want to have my special internet services or TV um, available. I still want my cell phone. I'm going to keep my vehicle. Um, and you're going to have to pay for food. So what, what are your costs, whether you're living in your home, in a rental property, or in a CCRC? One of the things about Terwilliger Plaza that is unique, I think we're the only ones um, anywhere around us, we do not require a meal plan. Um, why? Members like the freedom to choose and we're very close to a lot of dining options. Um, people have dietary restrictions and choices. So we offer a discount if you wanna eat meals here on site, but it is not a requirement. Um, to live at Terwilliger Plaza. Many people are surprised when they do this exercise and compare the costs. So it sounds like a lot, you're gonna be writing this check every month, but you don't have all those other costs that you're having to deal with um, to take care of your house or um, those other costs. Don't forget the non-financial aspects of giving up your home um, make your home maintenance and your vehicle for living in a community with amenities and people. So you've done the exercise, you know what your net worth is, you know what your monthly income and expenses are. Do you qualify? Every CCRC will have different qualification criteria. Most of us aren't going to tell you this is our black and white criteria. You got to have this or you can't move in here. And I'm not going to do that either. Why? It's just a lot of flexibility here. But there are two pretty simple rules of thumb that you can apply. Most communities are going to look for you to have two times the monthly fee for your income requirement. So if the rent on the apartment you're looking at is $5,000 a month, we're looking for you to have $10,000 a month in net income after you've taken income and subtracted out your expenses. M most CCRCs are also going to want to, to say that you have twice the net worth after subtracting that one-time membership fee. So if you have a $500,000 membership fee, they're going to look for you to have another a million dollars, right? So a million five, subtract the five, you still have twice as much as that a membership fee was. And the reason we don't have a hard and fast rule is there are different flavors of this. Some people have 10 times the net worth, but they don't have a lot of monthly income. Some people have amazing retirement plans and they have way more monthly income but they haven't saved that much, so their net worth is a little lower. So again, these are rules of thumb. 
they will give you some idea whether or not you can afford to move into a CCRC. Um, I already talked about this. If someone has a large pe pension, but few assets, if someone has a large net worth, but little monthly income, and if someone has an amazing long-term care policy, um, those are things we and most CCRCs are gonna take into consideration. Things we can't factor in is your medical or health conditions. If you're talking to a community that has a type A contract, they will be very interested in your health conditions. But that's not something we ask about. Um, it just isn't important for the type of contract we have. So Twilly or Plaza has a very broad range of prices, especially now that Parkview is opened. Um, one of the unique things about Terwilliger um, is that broad range of prices. And the board is very committed to having, to keeping some of our apartments affordable. The current market, uh, current market is demanding larger units, more bathrooms and high-end features. That's what we heard people wanted. In all kinds of um, ways we look at this, we knew we needed to build Parkview because that's what retirees want and many of them can afford that. However, Terwilliger has independent, uh, independent apartment studios with move-in fees of less than $81,000 and a monthly fee of $1,300. Those are pretty darn affordable rates. Um, a one bedroom, in the tower starts at 113,000 and goes up to a little over 400,000 with monthly fees ranging from uh, $2,000 to almost $4,000. All of those units are remodeled with the same level of finishes. The tower is old, but the apartments are all updated. And I'm sure you can work with our marketing team to get the price list so you have a better idea. The higher up the building, the better the view, the more expensive the apartment is going to be. But the monthly fees are consistent across the, with no regard to the views. Okay, hope everybody's still with me and the sun isn't calling you. I'm gonna talk about the tax benefits of a CCRC. These are unique to um, CCRCs. And I'm not giving you tax advice, I can't do that. So always check with your tax advisors, advisors, but the IRS recognizes that the life care contracts, those are type A and B, include prepaying for medical expenses that you might use in the, in the future. That means a portion of both your move-in fee and your monthly fees are considered a medical deduction. And this is true whether you ever use the health care benefits or not. So most facilities, including us, provide you a copy of the previous year's deduction letter, um, which is provided by our CPA and me. There are two methods allowed by the IRS, and it's explained in that letter. For the years 2019 through last year end, Terwilliger has averaged 35.6% of the fees paid as a medical deduction. I expect that number to go down. I expected it would go down in 2023 because the, the percentage is a direct ratio of total medical costs here divided by total operating costs. And as the operating costs go up because we opened Parkview, the medical costs are not really increasing that fast. So that 35% for the next few years is probably gonna be closer to, I'm guessing here now, I think it's gonna be closer to 21%. I hope I'm wrong. Part of it will depend on how, how much occupancy, how many people we have in healthcare, what the costs of those healthcare needs are, and, and what our actual ending costs of all of our operations are. So, I'm a real conservative person. That's what accounting is. I uh, estimated high on our operating costs and I have estimated low on the medical costs, but I think it could go as low as 21%. And that is applied, let me make sure. Um, 
Yeah. The medical deduction is only av available on the non-refundable portion of a membership fee. So again, we talked about refundable versus non-refundable membership fees. If you have a refundable fee, a uh, refundable contract, the medical deduction is not allowed. If you're going to get something back at the end, then you can't take that medical deduction. It is, though, available for all of your monthly fees. So the initial membership fee and the monthly fee, you can apply that same rate to it. If you're in assisted living or in a memory care facility or receiving um, other kinds of direct in-home care, those are in addition to the percentage of your membership fee that you might be taking as a medical deduction. Because generally, the fees you're paying for assisted living are a requirement for to meet your needs. They're, they're not, you're not just living there for convenience. If you were, then those fees would not be deductible. But because you need them um, to, to be cared for, those are also deductible in full. Um, property taxes. Um, we are exempt from income taxes, but not property taxes. The portion of our building that is used for strictly for care is exempt from part of the property taxes. The rest of the property taxes on the building, I take the total, divide it by the square footage of your apartments, and I give you information that you um, can talk to your tax advisor on taking as a deduction for property taxes, because clearly part of your fees are paying for property taxes. Other considerations that you might want to be thinking about, um, if you own a home and you sell the home, the deduction or the capital gains treatment of the home sale, that can be kind of painful. Um, the membership in the CCRC is not eligible for deferral of a gain on the sale of your personal residence. So I'd like to make sure people understand that. And the people have asked about the qualified charitable dis distributions from an IRA or a requirement uh, a qualified plan. Um, we have the three entities, Terwilliger Plaza, Lester Hoel, and Terwilliger Plaza Foundation. Only the operating entity, Terwilliger Plaza, can take a QCD. And you can't be receiving a benefit from that contribution, i.e. you can't take a QCD deduction to pay for your membership fee or your maintenance fees because you're getting a benefit. Okay, everybody take a breath. Um, so what happens if, you're, if your assets don't last and you run out of money? This is the last thing a CCRC wants to do is evict somebody because they can't stay. Um, in the case of a for-profit community, I saw this happen. It's not a fun situation. It happens here. People spend uh, live longer than we think they're going to, and costs may be higher than what we estimated when they first moved in. At Terwilliger Plaza, um, we many years ago they started a trust called the Lesta Howell Trust in recognition of Lesta, our founder. And it's available to help members who find themselves in a financially difficult problem. There are some qualifications. We will ask somebody who needs assistance to qualify for VA or Medicaid assistance if they do. Some people don't. I mean, they, they, they have too much income or don't qualify, but we want to make sure they have attempted to get assistance. You do need to reduce your costs by moving into the least uh, expensive unit that's available. Um, and we will look back, we will look at that initial qualification and what you told us your income and your costs were, your living costs were, and, if, and your assets. And if you have gotten rid of more assets than we thought, we're gonna ask you, where did the money go? If you gave it away, if you gave it to your children, if you did something foolish, we have the right to not support you with less to Hoel. We want to make sure that you live a reasonable and conservative lifestyle. And that's why you told us what your 
monthly income and expenses were going to be. Um, but if you've done all of this, then Les de Hoel is going to make sure that you get to stay here. Right now, Lester Howell holds about $5 million. It's exclusively for helping members of Terwilliger Plaza that have outlived their resources. In addition, the Terwilliger Plaza Foundation is committed to continue to raise money um, to support Lester Howell. A percentage of all uh, unrestricted donations to the foundation are allocated to Lester Howell for the current needs of other members. And members who choose to contribute to the foundation can earmark their funds to be used only for Les Well and for the support of current members. All of these arrangements are kept confidential. Um, there are just a handful of us here in the administrative office who have access to that information. And we are very respectful of the people and the situations they find themselves in. So we talked about a refundable contract and we talked about a non-refundable contract and you get a choice in a lot of communities to decide between those. Some communities, it's all of one or, or, or the other, but sometimes you do. And the question you should ask is, is it worth the extra cost? This gets a little complicated. I don't wanna get too complicated with you. Um, remember, every contract is diff different and most have some period of time that they're refundable, like ours over the first 40 months. And different communities might have a 50% refundable, an 80, a 75, a 90. Years ago, people had 100% refundable contracts, but you have to understand what each community is offering before you can do this calculation. I was gonna walk through it, but I know it's too much information. But let me tell you, there are a couple of things you have to have in mind if you're mathematically going to calculate the value of a refundable contract. You have to figure out how long you think you're going to live. You have to determine what interest rate you think you can earn in over the, that life expectancy. And you have to decide what you think the inflation rate will be over the remainder of your life. When you have those things, then you're going to compare the non-refundable option with the refundable. How much more does it cost to get some of it back as a refund? And how much can you earn on the difference between those two numbers? So then you're going to compare the cost of the refundable versus the non-refundable. Um, what is the amount you can earn on those proceeds if you didn't give them to us as part of that refundable fee? What's the present value of that amount? And this is going to be the true net cost of the traditional contract. So it's a little complicated. One of those websites at the end of this actually has some examples they can walk you through. Um, but each person has to think about this themselves. Since none of us know for sure how long you can live, none of us know for sure what the interest rates are going to be, and none of us know for sure what um, what you can earn at or what inflation is gonna be. There's a lot of guessing involved in this. Remember, you don't know any of these things. And when you're comparing those refundable versus non-refundable, consider what you want to leave to your heirs. If the membership fee at a CCRC is a large portion of your total net worth, you probably have more reason to want to have a refundable contract. If it's not, if you have a lot of other resources, again, you got to weigh the pros and cons and decide um, if you have children or grandchildren, whoever your heirs are going to be, whether that's an important part of your net worth to leave to somebody. In summary, we talked about nonprofit at Terwilliger. We talked about A, C, and B contracts. We've talked about buy-in fees versus monthly fees. We talked about whether you can afford a CCRC. Talked about some of the tax benefits and um, some non-financial considerations of a CCRC. I think that is our conclusion. 
Thank you, Judy. Very, very, very much. Lots of really good information. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, the first one, uh, probably halfway through, Judy, when you were talking about compare, you know, can you afford it? And when you're looking at your assets and your um, your expenses, uh, someone is asking, what are the main surprises when comparing CCRC costs to current costs? And I think people forget to factor in the cost of home maintenance. Um, you know, I'm still in my home and I had to replace a roof. It was shocking how much that roof cost. <laughs> I replaced it when we moved in 30 years ago and 30 years later, it was ah, three times as much to replace the roof. So, and then at some point, it's just finding somebody to help you with those home maintenance things that becomes costly. You know, at some point you don't want to mow the lawn anymore. So you're hiring people to do more and more and more. So to me, it's really understanding the cost of my home um, when I'm comparing to a CCRC, when somebody else takes care of all of it. Thank you, Judy. One of the things too that we see, oftentimes people will tell us, well, you know, my house is paid off, so I live free. And, um, you know, I think everybody that we work with has definitely has property tax, definitely has homeowner's insurance. And I think what we often see is when you add up taxes, homeowner's insurance, like the alarm fee, the yard maintenance fee, my gym memberships, all these things. And by the way, we do have a one page guide that we can send out when we send this uh, recording. Um, and, it, and it's a great exercise to go over what does it cost in my current house and what is included specifically here at Twilliger. So um, yeah, so there's just a lot of things that we think no, I, my house is paid off, which is great, but there's still there's still costs involved to maintain that home. Uh, let's see, what is the different, oh, uh, clarifying uh, the, this question, I don't understand the application of the rule of thumb to assets, quote, two times net worth after subtracting entry fee. What is two times net worth, uh, remaining net worth or other? So, Look at the, ma the maintenance or the initial move-in fee. You're looking for your, uh, take your net, net worth, subtract that fee, and you want two times that fee left. Does that make sense? So if you've got a $2 million net worth and the move-in fee is $500,000, you're fine. You still got a million five left. So two times the 500 is only a million. Sometimes we talk about it as three times. So forget about paying the fee first, but it, yes. let's say your membership fee is 500,000. We're going to look for three times that amount. So 1.5 million. And, yep. and remember it's net worth. It's not just your assets before you take out all your liabilities. Good way to talk about it. Um, let's see here. What is the difference between the Tewilliger Foundation and the Lesta Howell Foundation? Um, Lesta Howell can only be used for taking care of seniors who have run out of money at Terwilliger Plaza. The foundation has a broader definition of what it can use its resources for. They do not have to be restricted to Terwilliger Plaza, although traditionally um, they have been. And they can be used for the, the greater good of the whole community um, in independent living, um, but the LESTA funds generally are only used for people in assisted living. There are exceptions. People do run out of money even in independent living, but for the most part, those funds have only been used for people who are in assisted living. Next question. Great presentation, Judy. Not sure about the refundable contracts at Twilliger Plaza. I understand the 15% fee, 85% refund in the first six months, decreasing to 40 months. Is this available to everyone or is this the quote refundable option you told us about? So the non-refundable option is available anywhere at Terwilliger Plaza, but only the Heights and Parkview currently offer a refundable option. Um, we're, we're having discussions about doing a refundable for the tower, but 
uh, we traditionally not had a refundable in the tower. So those are all traditional or non-refundable, sorry. Let's see, here's one. Can you please discuss the use of mandatory IRA distributions to pay CCRC expenses? Yeah, mandatory distributions, um, if you take them out taxable, can be used for anything. But if you're using it as a QCD to avoid taxation on those mandatory distributions, then you cannot be receiving a benefit from those that contribution. Um, so you can't really use it for your monthly fees and you can't use it for your moving fee. But if you wanted to recognize um, a new piece of artwork that we're raising money for, you can do that as a QCD. It has to go to Terwilliger Plaza, not to the two supporting organizations because those QCDs are supposed to be used, consumed if you will, by the entity you're giving it to, not to make a bigger war chest for the nonprofit. I, I hope that makes sense. Um, if Jeff has other questions on that, we will put you two in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see, increases in monthly fees, how much, how often, average over the last five to 10 years? Really good question. Oh, I, I sometimes even talk about that. Teresa, what is the average over the last few years? Oh, you know, actually, I have the, the document right I know you here. do. <laughs> um, the last few years, I will tell you that anybody in our industry has had to raise their rates pretty, fa pretty fast because labor being 50% of our cost and labor went through the roof. Even finding people to work was uh, really tough. Um, it's yeah. stabilized, but... So for independent living over the last 20 years, it's been average 4%. Over the last five years, it's 5.4%. Mm -hmm. And that typically happens usually January 1. And our handbook and our um, your residency agreement states that you would receive a 45-day notice if that is going to, if there is going to be an increase. Yeah, because Parkview kept getting delayed in its opening, didn't open till December 1. Our board um, decided not to raise the fees on January 1st. Some people would have barely moved into the building and we would have been raising their, their rents. Um, so everybody got the benefit of no of fee increases not occurring until March 1st this year, but we will be going back to the January 1st. And the last question I have in the Q&A section, so that's a cue. If you still have a question, go ahead and type it in. Uh, regarding the tax benefit you mentioned, are those, meaning the medical and the property tax dedu deduction, taken each year as we fill out our tax forms? Thank you very much for lots of information. Yes. So the first year that you uh, take occupancy of your apartment, you get the benefit of the initial fee an extra bump in that medical deduction, but every year you are here or at a CCRC, you're going to have a medical deduction and a property tax deduction available. All right, I oh, here's one more. Since the board determines the changes on monthly fees and buy-in costs, who are the members of the board and how many are residents? Great question. Uh, such a cool question. This is one of the things that is so unique about Terwilliger. We have searched for the last seven years to find any other uh, um, board of directors like ours. As far as we know, we are the only self-governed, if you will, um, CCRC in the nation. What that means is we have 11 members of our board. Six of them must live in the building. And those elections are done um, we just had our election and then the board, the new 11 board members elect the officers of the board. So that process just happened. Um, we also have a finance committee that advises the board, as you can imagine, on the rates um, and, and other financial things that the board doesn't always have time to go into all the details of. And that tends to be almost 100% people who live in the building. So. Residents have a lot of say about how we, um, what our fees are going to be. 
Judy, do you want to um, mention the finance committee at all as it relates to proposing fee increases and so forth? Yeah, so the finance committee uh, meets every month as does the board of directors. The finance committee always meets before the board by several days. And the finance committee um, goes through the ugly details of financial things like insurance renewals, um, employee benefit renewals, wages, the budget for the next year, the capital budget, things that the board, it would really get bogged down if the board had to go through that, uh, all of those detail process. Then the finance committee will recommend to the board uh, acceptance of the of the rate increase or whatever it is that they're that they've gone through those details on. Um, our finance committee, like I said, is composed almost entirely of people who live in the building. They are appointed by the board of directors, the people who sit on that board. We try to find people who have some finance background because uh, it's a lot to grapple with some of the the information. Um, that is presented to to the finance committee to go through. Yeah, it's a it's a really robust group of people, and they ask great questions. And when I retire, I am not working that hard. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think I actually, uh, Judy, you can step in. But these are pretty straightforward, easy questions. The buy-in fee for a unit. How is the monthly fee affected by couple instead of a single? So that the pricing that Judy went over. I'm I'm doing this so you can get a drink of water, Judy. <laughs> um, the the membership fees and the monthly fees Judy mentioned uh, are single for the main. I'm sorry, the membership fee. If there's a second person in the home, it would be twenty thousand added to that membership fee. For the monthly fee, as we sit here today in 2024, the second person fee is five hundred and twenty-two dollars. Um, and Again, without having a mandatory meal pro program, some communities that can be as high as a thousand or twelve hundred or fifteen hundred dollars for a second person. But since we don't have that mandatory meal program, that's why ours is relatively low. And then the average square footage for a one bedroom in the one hundred to four hundred thousand dollar range. So we have about I think five different sizes of one bedroom homes. They go from Let's see, we've got a 576, we've got a 756, we've got an 890, and we've got a 954 square foot. So uh, I guess that's four. A couple, couple different options for you there. And would the monthly fees uh, you used in, in the example be double for a married couple? So I just answered that one. So not double, just an extra 20 grand for membership and 522 for monthly fee. I think... That is it for all of our questions. Um, so thank you, Judy, very much. This was a fantastic presentation, so much information. I've I've listened to you many times and every time I, I go through this, I learn something new and certainly a lot of good reminders. Um, looks like we have one more. What adjustments made were, what adjustments made when two persons evolved to one as far as fees on new living quarters? Very good question, that does happen. Well, the second, the monthly fee goes away and nothing happens to the initial fee. Some people choose to downsize um, if they, uh, you know, from a larger apartment when they lose a spouse to a smaller apartment. And we will take the value of the new apartment if we have one available. Um, and you can transfer your membership to a smaller apartment if you choose to, and we have it available. Yeah, the, the key with that one, some uh, somebody did ask a question earlier about, can I move to a smaller home? If I start in a bigger home, can I move to a smaller home after I move in? The answer is yes, we do have a $10,000 right now. It's $10,000 internal transfer fee. Um, so, but yes, there's lots of different reasons why people downsize. So certainly we would talk that through and help you kind of decide what the best option would be for you. Um, Alice asks, are there also two bedrooms available? Why, certainly there are a lot of, we do have two bedrooms available. Actually, we have two bedrooms in currently available in Tower Heights and Parkview. So lots of options. Um, the main difference, of course, between Tower Heights and Parkview is that Heights and Parkview all have balconies and all have washer and dryers in the homes. 
what's your current waiting list? Well, right this current moment, we don't necessarily have a waiting list. We do have some people on our waiting list that has existed over the years, but we currently have availability. Part of that is because of opening this new building called Parkview. So you do not have to wait. Uh, I know some of our friends in the community have, I, I don't know, I think I've heard up to a five-year wait list at some of the communities, but luckily we have some new inventory because we just opened Parkview and some of our members who lived in Tower and Heights chose to move over to the new building, which was great for you because it opened options in every single building. So if you're considering a move soon, uh, soon meaning the next six months or so to a year, definitely reach out and we can uh, have you come in and take a look. Okay, well, thank you again, everyone. Uh, please go out and enjoy the sun. I'm looking out the window now and it's absolutely gorgeous. So thank you, thank you. And uh, we hope to see you at one of our upcoming events. Have a wonderful day.